Hello world, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Siraj used AI to synthesize my voice and now I will say whatever he wants. Facebook sucks. Ha 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 ha. Hello world, it's Siraj. And Google just released a paper titled Towards a Human-Like Open Domain Chatbot. In it, they describe a chatbot named Mina that can have conversations about any topic with responses that are more human-like than any other known chatbot. Natural language processing continues to be one of the hottest subfields of AI. And the best part is that using open source tools, we too can create an artificial personality. Here's a short demo I hacked together as an example. It's an Obama chatbot trained on his past speeches, but uses Donald Trump's voice. In the period after World War II, you had a growing middle class that was the engine of our prosperity. Pretty weird, right? In this episode, we'll learn about Mina's technology and how it compares to previous generations of chatbots. Then we'll walk through the necessary steps to build our own talking head chatbot. Chatbots aren't just hype. They are today being used across a wide range of industries. For example, Casisto launched a financial chatbot called Kai in 2016. Now it has 18 million users interacting with it to help with a wide range of financial tasks, from retail transactions to banking assistance. Wobot is a chatbot trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, offering users 24-7 real-time automated therapy. Babylon Health has a chatbot that can generate a diagnosis based on user responses, and it's quickly becoming one of the most popular health apps in the UK. 24-7 access to a bot trained on thousands of different biomedical papers in your pocket. I have a slight migraine. You have cancer. And the history of chatbots can be divided into three major eras, rule-based, retrieval-based, and generative. The first real chatbot was rule-based, created by an MIT researcher in 1964 with the goal of demonstrating that the communication between man and machine was superficial. It was a script that followed simple psychotherapy rules to replicate a human therapist. The script he used assigned a value to each word in the user input sentence and used that value to reorder the words into a question. The value of each word is computed by its relevance in the sentence. Pronouns get low values, action verbs get higher values, and the highest value goes to the full action. In this way, the script can flip a sentence around to ask empathetic, reflective, non-judgmental questions. Interestingly, even though there was no learning involved, people still got emotionally attached to Eliza. The next generation of chatbots involved retrieval-based systems like Mitsuku. Mitsuku had a database of 3,000 objects encoded in it, and each object had 21 attributes, summing up to 300k possible response patterns for a user input. When a keyword was detected from the user input that matched an object in the database, it was able to describe that object and use it in a comprehensive way as a response. But the creators had to constantly update its database to reference current pop culture events that its users were talking about, like Parasite winning the Oscars. And that brings us to the current generation of chatbots, the generative models. These methods involve learning from data using deep learning. And the one that really started it all was probably one of my top three favorite papers of all time, a neural conversational model by Vinyals. After a series of tweaks over the years to that model, we've now arrived at the modern renaissance of neural language models in 2020. In their blog post, Google demonstrated some incredibly human-like sample conversations with Mina. I was most surprised at how Mina demonstrated the appearance of humor, because humor takes a lot of high-level abstract thinking, including the ability to understand the context of a conversation. Some of the conversations about mathematics and philosophy demonstrated the appearance of critical thinking, like asking a user for supporting arguments toward a claim they made and countering their statements with supporting evidence. But while all of these conversations are impressive, the most important thing I learned from reading their paper was that bigger isn't always better for deep neural networks applied to natural language processing tasks. Let me explain. 
MENA, like all state-of-the-art language models these days, is a variation of the popular transformer architecture, the one that's enabled a recent renaissance in NLP, but MENA isn't the biggest transformer on the block. It's big AF, don't get me wrong. It's a neural network with 2.6 billion parameters, and it took 30 days of training on a full version TPU v3 pod. That's 2,048 TPU cores, which comes out to over 100 petaflots of sustained compute, or $1.4 million in compute time. A few months ago, NVIDIA Research presented a transformer model called Megatron with 8.3 billion parameters, which is over three times the size of MENA and 24 times the size of BERT, last year's state-of-the-art transformer model. But Megatron achieved a score of 90.7% on the Stanford Question Answering Dataset, which is a measure of a language model's comprehension ability. BERT, a much smaller model, achieved a similar score. But if we go further back to 2015 and conjure up Andre Karpathy's legendary blog post titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks, we can see how Andre's 3.5 million parameter network, while capable of generating text, clearly lacked the coherency of BERT. So bigger definitely matters, but up to a certain point. After a certain point, in order to achieve gains in performance, we can, instead of increasing the amount of hardware, define new human-assisted optimization goals. The MENA authors defined a metric titled the Sensitivity and Specificity Average, or SSA, to score each of MENA's responses. The network was trained to improve that score as much as possible through gradient descent, the standard way neural networks learn. The reason they chose this metric is because many neural chatbots tend to output legitimate words, but those words often don't make sense, meaning they don't adhere to common sense or a basic coherent structure. Almost all human-produced statements are sensible, except for Chief Keef's songs. But they also knew that sensibility alone was not enough, because sensible statements can be very vague. For example, if we go to talktotransformer.com to ask GPT-2 the question, what's inside a water bottle? That makes sense, but it's not specific enough. We naturally were expecting a more specific answer. That's why they also optimized specificity, given the context of the conversation, to discourage vague replies. Mina was trained on 40 billion words, or 341 gigabytes of social media conversations. We don't know which social media sites were used, but probably Reddit, Twitter, and Google+, just kidding. The task was to learn the association between these dialogue pairs with an input sequence and an output sequence. Naturally, the state of the art in sequence to sequence modeling, the transformer comes to mind to use here, so they did. After training on the static conversations, Google recruited internal volunteers to help train MENA through manual labeling. It was a training strategy that involved a volunteer marking a score for each response MENA gave them for both sensibility and specificity. Once a large enough dataset was created, MENA was further optimized using that SSA metric. This clearly points to some exciting directions that NLP research will inevitably take these next few years. The SSA score was a brilliant idea, but there are so many other dimensions to human conversation besides those two. Think fluency, empathy, factuality, humor, meme dankness. The same strategy of human-assisted labeling could theoretically be extended to the full range of different aspects of a conversational response, which could result in a chatbot that is totally indistinguishable from a human faster than you might expect. And Google clearly recognizes that. They stated, and I quote, we are evaluating the risks and benefits associated with externalizing the model checkpoint. However, we may choose to make it available in the coming months to help advance research in this area. OpenAI similarly withheld its fully trained GPT-2 model for a while, setting a precedent for this kind of cautionary slow release process. The fact that MENA is the most human-like chatbot without being the biggest means that it's not all about more computing power. It's about more intelligent algorithms. And that means more opportunities for startups and students without lots of resources to discover valuable new architectures and create profitable services using modern, freely available language models. I'll show you what I mean. Let's walk through the process of building a generative chatbot using text, audio, and video tools. The team at Hugging Face has the best documented repository 
on transformer language models I have ever seen. And their associated blog posts on how they all work are well worth a read, so check them out. They've got the full range of state-of-the-art models by different companies and the community at large using transformers like BERT, GPT-2, ExcelNet, and more. We'll use Python to load up the pre-trained GPT-2 model, retrain it on our presidential speech dataset by Kay Fogel on GitHub. We've got 900 US presidential speeches in text format here. There's a lot, so let's just use the Obama speeches. We can define it as our transfer learning data set, applying what it's learned and what it will learn together to come up with a powerful text prediction engine. After training, we can test it out by asking it questions. If you don't have a GPU, be sure to use Google Colab instead. Once we have our model all ready, we can train our voice cloning agent. This is based on the WaveNet model by DeepMind, which was just the state of the art in human-like audio generation, using tons of convolutional blocks to capture information. An encoder will represent the text, and a decoder will try to reconstruct it. And in just a few examples, the representation will be robust enough to mimic that person. It's got both a command line and a graphical user interface. Use whichever one you prefer. Once trained, we can test it out. Hello world, it's Barack Obama, how are you? We can generate a video from this audio snippet using ObamaNet by DF Blue. What it does is use a technique called key point generation to predict the mouth representation points given audio as input. The audio is represented using spectral features. 68 facial key points are extracted from each frame of the video using the publicly available DLive facial landmark detection tool. Next, since the data necessary for video generation is in image pairs, the input face image is cropped around the mouth and annotated with the mouth outline. Then the output image is the complete face. There will be one image per second of video. So after we input a question to the language model, it'll return a response. From that response, we can generate audio. And from that audio, using ObamaNet, it'll correlate each sound wave with a different mouth key point layout, frame by frame, until it generates a full video. In the period after World War II, you had a growing middle class that was the engine of our prosperity. There will increasingly be more opportunities to create new services and discoveries around these tools over time. I've got relevant links for you in the description, and I can't wait to see what you build. So until next time, happy learning.